do do. Do 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 Can you hear? We just add it as underneath the title. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Presenters, you can go ahead and link if you want to link to your PowerPoint or to a handout right beneath your title. Okay. And just note there are two rounds, so if you don't see your name in round one, scroll down to the, the second round. And we'll um, keep sharing the link to this document in the chat. Mm -hmm. If anyone's having trouble finding it or has questions, please um, unmute yourself. Alex, um, in your experience with the conference, how how timely are attendees? Um, some come in time and actually, I, my last session, there's some some of them were coming in actually half an hour and 40 minutes within the presentation and then started. So I'll just let them in. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Take those. So we have about we have about four minutes left. Just again, just want to make sure that everybody has their uh, audio and video muted when uh, presenters present for themselves. Uh, be great. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wants to share their screens if they have any video embedded? Looks like we could. I might as well just share. I'm going to um, give the slideshow a go here. Sure. Thanks for joining folks who are just coming in. Nice to see so many faces from afar. Yeah, it looks good. Oh, thanks, Amy. Yeah, I did. so we might anticipate some late arrivals.
have about a minute left at all. So what I'm going to ask everyone is if you guys can kindly mute your, your audio and your videos, please. Shout out to Nate and Ian O'Brien. Nice to see you guys. Hi, Ramey. Hey, Troy. Yeah, other than whoever's going to be presenting, I can just put you guys uh, meet, uh, meet your videos, please. Hi there. Hi, Maureen. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to get started in a moment. We're just, we're sort of waiting for people to filter in, but I think... I've been trying to get in since like 12. Was it open or is it just me? Um, we're here and we're very excited to get started. So, uh, good. I'm glad I made it. So I'll begin, thank you to everyone who's here uh, live and to those tuning in later. We're so happy to have you. They've taken time out of your busy pandemic schedules to um, present or attend. It's, uh, it's such a nice time to get together from afar. Um, in case you weren't sure where you are, you are in our Delight Roundtable session, teaching English education across modalities through digital literacy. We have 25 different speakers here today. So there are incredible, um, difficult choices um, in a few minutes for which roundtable you might attend. Um, but before we move into those, actually, if you can go back one slide, these are all the different ways you can connect with our commission. So um, a lot of people here are members, but if you're not, it's, it's free and we invite you to join us in our work that's focused on digital literacies and future ed. Um, there's a link here at the bottom of the slide, which you cannot click, but I will post a link in the chat for how you can sign up to join our commission, which would involve, uh, we send out emails about once a month with different working groups and projects um, involving um, smaller groups of members. And then one of our highlights is getting together for our commission meeting which this year is virtual, but mark your calendar for December 3rd. Um, it's in the evening, I, I believe it's 6 p.m., but, but we can double check, and if you join our email list, you'll get a reminder about that. Um, we're also pretty active on Facebook, so that's you can note the name of our Facebook group and search for us that way. Okay. So we are treated to a wonderful keynote today by Donna Alberman, who is the UGA appointed distinguished research professor of language and literacy education. Uh, she'll be starting in just a moment. And after her keynote, we will um, transition into two different rounds of breakout rooms. So you'll have two um, opportunities to choose a breakout session. And we will, um, you know, when we move into those rooms, we'll share the titles of all the presentations and the options for you so you can move yourself into the breakout room of your choice. Um, so without further ado, unless Nicole, are, is there anything else you'd like to share before we get going? No, but during the, the, um, the keynote session, if you, may, if you could please turn your audio and video off, it helps a little bit with bandwidth. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Donna, for joining us. We're so happy you can um, do this. And without further ado, teaching to end the bottomless silence. Thank you very much. Glad to be here and welcome everyone. Um, in my first slide, uh, historical uh, back one. <laughs> yeah, 
there we go. Uh, this is my first slide, and in historical so silences have always interested me since I was a high school student in the 1950s. I can still recall the day that my favorite history teacher uh, asked how many of us thought Columbus had discovered America. All our hands went up. And he said, it's time for a history unit on who was here before Columbus. So in seven slides within 10 minutes, I'm going to share with you how that unit eventually led to my developing a pedagogy for teaching, how to end bottomless silences. In slide two, uh, in developing that pedagogy for how to end uh, injustices and, uh, and silences on racial policies, etc. I owe thanks to all the people who have worked on updating NCT's belief statement for integrating technology into the ELA classroom in 2018. And in slide three, I also owe a note of gratitude for having been invited to write this piece, highlighted in the red, it was published in 2019, along with other members of the Delight Commission and a themed issue in contemporary issues in te teaching, sorry, in technology and teacher education. My research at that time was focused on the complexities of why we as ELA educators do critical literacy instruction and the assumption of what the underlying effects are on students. In slide four, at this time, or about the same time, I was uh, reviewing a video of the artists who were associated with an exhibition at Wallace Art Gallery at Columbia University. And that was uh, a viewing that really inspired my title for today. So that's why I want to thank them. In slide five, the Baldwin Hall protest at UGA 11, 15, 18. This was about an incident that was uncovered and had started in 2015, in which at which time three years uh, after the remains of human individuals believed to have been slaves were found during construction at renovating Baldwin Hall. Prof protesters gathered outside the building and asked the president of UGA, and I quote, when will the University of Georgia publicly acknowledge the history of slavery? When will the university issue an apology? Unquote. Now, two years after that 2018 protest, a student group calling itself Beyond Baldwin is asking every faculty senate on campus to support them in transforming UGA into an anti-racist and a Black Lives Matter campus. So far, their petition for us to join and support them has been approved by the Arts and Sciences uh, College. It's now being considered by my college, the Mary Frances Early College of Education. In slide six, in January 2020, I don't know whether as a result of the Baldwin protest, no one knows for sure, but in a January 2020 MLK demonstration, activists demanded reparations for 40 African American families evicted from their homes during an urban renewal plan back in the 19, late 1950s that was used in part to build several UJ dormitories. Later, I was in a public meeting of the athens Clark County Commission. Everyone is asked to, or feel free to join in this videotaped on Tuesday evenings. The evening that I uh, was present, and I've been present for several, was when a former resident of the project was asked 
what it was like as a child at that time of her family's eviction. She spoke strongly and recalled facts of things such as, quote, my father was gainfully employed and he tried to maintain a home for his family. Linentown was not a slum area. Linentown was the home of both blacks and whites, lower income families who were trying to survive and make homes for their families right opposite the University of Georgia. Interestingly, and quite by coincidence, I learned that the impetus for the Linentown project grew from historical records found in UGA's special collections libraries. In slide seven, I explain how that special collections libraries um, forum was especially helpful to me because after I had heard all of these things, especially the Linentown project, that's where the records were found telling exactly what had happened. I decided I would like to be part of a 12 member annually appointed uh, faculty forum in which people both of uh, tenure track and non-tenure track, I'm glad for that, are asked to apply with projects that they'd like to uh, complete. It's not an overly subscribed program, but I'm so glad I applied because actually that 12 month program that I've been in since January, 2020 has, act has actually influenced and made possible the successful um, integration of an archival based pedagogy into my already existing digital literacies class. It's for graduate students, and I had 21, including people from comparative lit, linguistics, and of course from the College of Education, mostly. And from that project, uh, I gained support from the archivists at the library, Special Collections Library. And so they've formed a team, and they've been helping in collaborating with my class, and they'll continue in the spring semester of 2021. I will teach that same course again at that time. Thank you. And if you'd like references, please contact me at dalvermo at uga.edu. Thank you so much, Donna. And I think that's a great um, lead into our roundtables for today as we think about the ways in which digital literacies and enable us to connect with our communities and create these pods of advocacy. So thank you very much. Um, as we move on to our first round, here's how it's going to work. Our tech guru, Alex, is going to put us into um, or a, a create 12 breakout rooms. And you, as participants, can decide where you'd like to go. Um, we have a list here. And then in the chat, we've also shared a link to the schedule for today so that if we, you know, if you move out from this main room and you go into a breakout room and you want to see the schedule, you have access to that through the link that's shared in the, in the chat. But this is the first round, and you can see the breakout room number, the presenters, and their roundtable titles to give you some sense of what you have in store for the roundtable session for this first round. So as Alex is helping us open up the breakout rooms, consider, decide where you'd like to go for this first round, and we'll move into the roundtable sessions. We have a few minutes here, so roundtable presenters, um, you'll have a few minutes as people filter in and we kind of figure out how people get into breakout rooms before you present, and um, then roundtable presenters can, can get going. Okay, you want me to open up the breakout rooms? Thank you, Alex, yes. Okay, yeah, well, they're, perfect. they're open now. Uh, presenters, please note the number of your breakout rooms so you can self-select your room. Yes. Um, we also, so the link to the schedule is in the chat, and we've asked presenters who are interested in doing so to share links to
what's it doing out here? Hey, you are hello. Hello, hello. Can you see us? I can Tom? see you. Can hello, you see hello. Us? How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Yourself? I'm good. Yes, I'm trying. Are, are we also in your like in your face with our with our camera? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. You're. Yeah. You're. I'm. I got two screens, so I just moved you to my other okay. side. So. This is terrific. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to meet uh, my research partner and partner in crime. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> Tor Patrick McGrail. Okay, I guess we will be starting with our presentation, okay? Okay. Um, and then there will be question, question time. So um, I guess we will do our presentation, then we will have question time. So let's let we will find our way to our PowerPoint and do all this sharing. And I'll turn off my video. So, so bear with us for a moment. Okay, screen share. Okay, screen share. Just let us know, can you already see our screen? I can. Okay, we're going into presenter mode. All right. Okay, so welcome to our session. We already did presentations of who we are, but what we're doing in today's session, really, we will be, um, we will be really reviewing the different strategies that we use to support students in composing with sound and word and uh, podcasting. So there are many really reasons why podcasting matters. And for one, uh, it is a great storytelling medium and storytelling is the richest and the oldest way humans have communicated and conveyed information. Sound not only communicates meaning, but can also serve aesthetic uh, purposes. Uh, sounds can be beautiful on their own. And of course, our voice and the sounds we make reveal and can affect emotions such as happiness, joy, boredom, or fear. Despite all of this, in our educational context, there is really not much on sound design in professional literature. Moreover, when students use sound in the video projects or audio projects, they often use it as an afterthought or an add-on, just to dress up the presentations, make it, you know, look more good, you know, make it look better, sound better, rather than really using it as a powerful and meaningful tool for meaning making. The fall, um, in my work with teachers and doctoral students, I teach podcasting as a rich tool for meaning making, um, with its own convent conventions, affordances, and limitations. And most of all, I really see it, and I want my students to understand that this is a critical component in oral, or in some cases, audio audiovisual um, composition. So here are the steps uh, that I use in my college uh, classroom. We start with an analysis of sample podcasts. Um, from NPR, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Everything is Alive radio show, um, which provide really amazing podcasts on almost any topic. I use student podcasts as mentor texts, and the following questions really guide our explorations of those, sample, of those samples or mentor texts, if you will. What makes a podcast a podcast? Um, what makes a quality podcast? What can storytelling just with voice and sound do? Uh, we also examine sample scripts to really solidify understanding about the podcast as a genre and its key components, opening and closing tune, a tagline, introduction, main body. Okay, what, what happens at the end that is closing? the characteristics of spoken word versus, versus written word, conversational style, short sentences, active voice, and so on and so on. 
So, and the professional literature that we read really provides that larger context and also questions for our discussions and explorations. So now students are really, really ready to write their own scripts and receive feedback. So actually the assignment that they produce asks them the following, write a script and create a one to three minute podcast to assist you in teaching your students. The content of the podcast should connect to and support the curriculum you teach. So the next two steps are really related to production and they include learning about podcasting applications and editing tools. And um, uh, we really work um, a lot with Audacity and audio recording and editing um, application. And, and then the students are producing and editing the podcast, of course, with the support of the instructor. And I also have a research assistant who has an instructional technology background and is, and is a support um, here uh, for our students. It really adds more of, students feel more comfortable knowing that they have a tech support on the side. Uh, and I also feel comfortable because if I cannot handle some questions, I also have my uh, GRA, um, uh, as someone I could refer to. So I would like to share and, and actually celebrate a podcast designed and produced by Kelly Bryan Hyatt, a high school teacher who really did an amazing job with hers. Um, the podcast provided an alternative and an engaging format for a personal essay for her students. Um, enjoy. Hi, this is Miss Brian, and you're listening to. Wait, what were we supposed to do again? If you're tuning in, you were probably absent from class or daydreaming in class. Luckily for you, I created this podcast as a way for you to revisit assignment expectations whenever you'd like. Today's episode features the personal philosophy, this I believe narrative. Throughout this unit, we've explored diverse cultural beliefs through didactic works and works of wisdom from Lao Tzu, Confucius, and Rumi. Your task is to develop your own This I Believe essay that reflects your personal philosophy. In the 1950s, journalist Edward R. Murrow hosted a weekly radio series, inviting listeners to write about the core beliefs that guide their daily lives. In 2005, This I Believe was revived for NPR as a way to encourage people to develop respect for beliefs different from their own. You can access example This I Believe essays and a graphic organizer to help with your planning on Edmodo. Happy writing! This is, th these are more uh, specifics. She has an outline, the graphic uh, organizer that she was talking about, and I just here just um, uh, posted just an excerpt from her assignment uh, description. So it, as you see, she herself has created a, uh, a podcast in a, I believe, kind of um, mode to introduce an assignment to her students. And as she says, you know, um, sh she felt that that I believe, uh, since I believe uh, began on the radio, it felt really fitting that the focus of my podcast would be providing an introduction of assignment expectations and brief background and the history of this I believe essay. And that's what she just did. She, she also introduced them to the history of the uh, NPR program. Okay. <clears throat> So in another context, we see here the main building of Jacksonville State University, where I and my colleagues teach a course in podcasting to broadcast and communication students. And the focus is a little bit different from what my wife uh, does with her folks. Um, in my podcasting courses um, in communication, uh, one of the things that we're very concerned with is making sure students uh, don't cuss and don't use inappropriate language or content. So we ask them to comply with FCC regulations on air with what are called the Pacifica standards, 
which basically are the seven deadly words you can't say on air. Uh, in addition to this, we also want to stress voice and mic technique. Uh, this is more important than you might imagine. A person needs to be able to speak clearly and cleanly. They have to practice the articulation of complicated words if those uh, occur. And if they have an accent, you don't have to lose your accent, but you have to manage it. Um, you want to reach the greatest number of people with your spoken voice because typically a podcasting doesn't have a video overlay. And so you're communicating strictly with your voice, it's theater of the mind. So also proper technology is important. You wanna have a professional mic, a good mixer, and other ancillary equipment that helps to produce that crisp, clear, professional product. But don't neglect content, narrative structure of the piece, persuasion techniques, what kind of audience you are addressing. All of these are important factors in an interesting podcast and teaching how to make a podcast. So the first step that we usually start with is students can select any topic of interest to them that they feel will have interest to the general public. Unfortunately, this is very broad. There are many topics they can choose from. Crime is a huge one. Um, when NPR came out with that beautiful um, multi-part um, uh, serial podcast that was amazing popular. Sports are always popular in the days of COVID. Everybody wants to talk about when sports is going to return to normal. Entertainment. Uh, theaters are closed right now, so Netflix has really picked up steam as have the other streaming entertainment venues. Social issues are always hot. Technology is always interesting as it changes our lives. And politics, of course, with the recent ascendance of President so after the student has selected a topic, the next step is to create a treatment, okay? Now what that is, is a blow-by-blow -blow outline of the elements of the proposed podcast. And what we mean by this is everything in the podcast is going to be spelled out. It has to be very detailed because if you plan interview segments, if you plan separate discussions, if there's going to be a co-host, all of these elements need to figure into podcast. We also stress that a good podcast should be no longer than 15 minutes. Most of the popular ones are between 7 and 15 minutes. We teach students also to segment the podcast so that there are breaks from uh, commercial messages. And this is how your podcast stays on air and how you may actually be able to make a profit from it. Typically with a podcast you have a first segment where you introduce yourself, there's a little musical teaser and that's the overview then you move on to segment two which is often an interview with a person of interest uh, for the topic you have selected in segment three you may introduce some kind of round table or you may have some kind of discussion between that speaker and another speaker or you may have a speaker on phone from a remote location or you may just uh, take in uh, callers to the podcast. Finally, you wrap up. You bring your own opinion to things, and you figure out uh, for your audience just what that podcast meant. And of course, you want to um, invite people to visit the podcast again. Naturally, you're going to want to be producing more than one podcast. You want to do that serially if possible. Uh, the writing process is very important because once the treatment is set up, you're not done yet. Um, some professionals and some topics demand that there be segments of this that's, that are fully scripted. Uh, sometimes, uh, particularly NPR, they, they script a lot. They're going to script a lot of what their uh, hosts say. If that's Lock Me Shring or somebody like that, they're really going to do very, very well with that. Um, however, other professionals wing it because they have a strong grasp of what they're going to say. They have uh, really consulted with the writers on the treatment so they know what they're going to say and approximately what they're going to work with. And they just prefer to have it be fresh like that. When you are writing your script, it's important to use crisp and active verbs. Okay? You 
don't say the man was arrested by the police. You say the police arrested the man. Okay, see? Active tense. You want to develop questions for your interviewees, and they should be specific questions. Don't beat around the bush. Ask direct questions. Also, be very clear and explain everything you're going to say and do, because particularly when we don't have any video, they have to go entirely by, by what they hear, you know, the words and the sounds that they hear from the podcast. Finally, you want to start thinking about appropriate music, okay? Uh, whether that's moody or upbeat or conclusory or introductory, you always want pieces of music throughout the piece. People love that. It is very, um, it's a technique that increases what psychologists call relatability which is people's willingness to continue to listen to the messages. Finally, all right, now you're in producing and recording mode, okay? Now, particularly if the writer is the talent, but this is always true, but especially if the writer is the talent, and, that, and the writer is primarily a writer and not talent, you want to rehearse the written parts before you begin recording, uh, just as Evan and I did prior to this uh, adventure that we're in right now. We had to rehearse things. So you want to rehearse those parts before you record when you're comfortable. You want to make sure your mic technique is solid, which you're using a, a windscreen if you possibly can, and a good quality mic. Record digitally using your microphone. Put that into a mixer so you can control levels. And finally, record that onto a digital audio workstation. Adobe Audition, you use um, the Sonus mixer, but there are 400 mixers out there, there's 1,800 microphones or something, so there are a lot of very, very good choices. You'd be surprised what $100 can do. Uh, finally, editing. Once you're done all that, you're not completely done. Now you have to clean this up. You want a professional product, and that means you've got to clean up your audio, take away those... <gasps> You know, breaths and all those hums, maybe the air conditioner is on and that sound needs to be removed. Professional editors can remove these things now. They're very powerful. Clicks can be done with it. Uh, something, something that professionals often do with these is to remove excessive spaces between words. It's possible that you pause too much between words and so it's possible to remove those things in the editing. Then step three, here's where you're gonna to wanna to add in and mix in the music, but not too loud. We also recommend that any music you do use be instrumental in nature. Don't have a vocal because it can interfere with people's understanding of the spoken word that you're trying to uh, put out there, okay? Finally, add sound effects and sweepers whenever necessary, but don't make them excessive, okay? Just a few here and there, Perhaps there's some kind of odd, humorous thing you want to talk about, and then you might have that kind of sound or something like that. That's fine, but don't do it too much. Uh, less is more, as they say. Finally, when all the pieces are together, you have all the sound effects, the music, and your voice all together, and it sounds really great, you want to master that audio. This is a technique where you just uh, where you put compression and other effects on it, equalization really produce something that's going to sound terrific. You can hear it on the NPR or just over your speakers at home. And that's the editing process. Um, this is an... Hey, what do you say, folks? It is the Iron Patriot, and you're listening to America, Guts, Glory, and Greatness. we got a great show coming up for you this week. This week, we're sitting down with David J. Harris. Yes, the David J. Harris. Also sitting down with the Hodge Twins, Kevin and Keith, yes, the big boys themselves are going to be right here on America. Guts, glory, greatness. Be sure you tune it in. We're listed on Spotify, Pandora, as well as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Breaker, and many, many more. Anywhere you can find a podcast, you can find America. Guts, glory, greatness. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. That's my colleague, Mr. Billy Ramsey. He teaches the podcasting class with me. Um, he is a podcaster. He tends to be a conservative podcaster himself, and uh, I, that's him winging it. I just asked him to deliver something, and he just delivered. See, that's what a professional can do. They can just get up there and produce. 
Um, you may have noticed the um, lights going on and off on the mixer. That's an example of the mixer processing the sound. Um, Billy does a lot of podcasting and he teaches a section of our podcasting class um, at Jackson State University. So that's uh, basically how that works. And um, at this point, if you have any questions, we'd be delighted to hear them. That mode. Oh, we have more participants. Wonderful. <laughs> if anyone has any questions. I have a question. Um, yes. I'm adding in podcasting in a lot of my classes. Um, so mixers again, you mentioned mixers. What mixers do you recommend that are kind of affordable, I guess? Sure. Well, you know, uh, in, there's a picture of it in early one of our slides. Honey, can we go back to one slide? That one with the mixer. I want to show you what this is because these are available. I, I was just in the music store the other day and they have it and it's just... This, this, this little puppy is not very expensive. Um, not the big one, because that's kind of pricey, but it was that other little one. Where is it? Right here. Slide six. We're going to pop that up for you. Okay. This wait, is wait, an wait. Yeah. All right. He's going to share. All right. We're going to have this up for you in just a sec. Slide six. Yeah. Can you see that, guys? Hold on. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, there it is. Is that it? This one? No, not that one. That's a nice one, but that's rather expensive. Hold on. I'm going to roll it back. Just roll it back. Just a second. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Bear with us for a sec. Is that it? Oh, in my presentation. Yes, it's in your presentation. Oh. This one. Oh, okay. Right there. This is the Alesis Multimix FX, okay? And this little guy is about 130 bucks. You probably can do better. That was my retail price. You probably can do a little bit better if you go Amazon. Okay. Alesis Multimix is a little eight track mixer. It'll support, see what's nice is, it'll take in uh, your line level sources from CDs so you can do music mix that together it's got eq it'll mix that together with your voice and you can plug in a mixer it supports phantom power so if you have a condenser style microphone and those are high quality it will support that you've got a mastering control it's got a separate output for your speakers and an amplifier it's just a nice little mixer and i own one of these myself and uh, the gentleman who did that podcasting this is his unit he has one as well well, these are our nice little mixers. Obviously, there are 46 gajillion of them out there. Um, and if you want to give me a price range, I can certainly, you know, guide you. Okay, that that sounds like a... A thousand bucks. <laughs> I have a different recommendation. <laughs> that one sounds perfect <laughs> on price range. Beautiful. Um, also, sound effects. Uh, how do you... Yes. Because um, one thing you talk about is, you know, uh, uh, copyright and ownership. Are, do you have places where you can do, uh, where there's open share files for music or sound effects? Sure. So Creative Commons has done amazing lots of stuff. And other free sites online, will give you all, they, they don't just have music, they have sound effects. Mm -hmm. they have little, all the little basic ones. Um, so you can use those if you want. Um, there, there is, there is, there is a specialized mixer called a Rhoda Focus, and it has its own little button that'll play sound effects that are already built into the mixer. So it is specialized for podcasters who want to do that. So a lot of options. That's in the several hundred dollar range. Okay. I think those things are like 350 or something like that. So it depends what you want to pay for. Obviously, you just can take a CD player or a DVD and um, have a CD full of effects and roll those in and press the button whenever you want to when you're recording your vocal that way. Um, and of course, with Audacity, you can make this a little bit more automated. I just started using Audition, uh, so I don't know how many um, effects, but I'm sure they have some effects on that yes, as well. Yes, Audition is a powerful, powerful program, and it's what we use for everything. We teach Audition up at school because we believe it's a skill our students need to use right. 
as broadcasting and film people. Yeah. We just need to know. And our school has the Adobe suite available to all our students, so I think. Yes. Yes. And, uh, and audition, there's almost nothing you can't do, and it even has music applications. So um, it's, it's a powerful program, and it's uh, really, really good. Of course, you probably know that for the person that doesn't want to spend a lot of money, free is a great price. Yeah, Audacity is good. Audacity is yeah. free. So say that to everyone else who yeah. listening. Audacity is a great starter program. You can do a lot with it, and it doesn't cost any money at all, and it's for Mac and PC. Mm -hmm. And it's user-friendly. Right? Yes, my reasonably. Students, yeah, my students are so afraid. Some of the students were afraid of the, when they think editing, yeah. you know, sound editing. Um, when when we walk them through the, the, the key features, of, uh, the basic features of Audacity, they pick up very quickly, and, and it takes away that fear from Does any one of you um, uh, use um, um, podcasting in your work? Maybe we could hear also from others um, what kind of projects you are doing. I can talk about, um, for my YA Lit class, I have them do a podcast on speculative fiction, um, on mm -hmm. the book club for speculative fiction. Um, and Sounds great. So they do it. Their audience are other teachers that would listen to the podcast and learn more about the book and maybe how to go about teaching it. And students seem to enjoy that. I'm also do I do um, remediating research for my advanced comp composition class, and I I try to convince them to uh, remediate research into podcasting or at least maybe a digital story. So um, I've had some yeah, really good. I I think particularly the digital story is, is, is something that I think we as educators, we do often in different contexts. And yes, my students enjoy doing, um, doing and creating digital, um, digital stories. And I also do that in my literature course. Um, and it's, it's just amazing uh, um, how much fun they have with, with it, but also um, you know, how, how interesting and engaging it can be for the for the students. So they create like trailers, you know, uh, trailers for to introduce young adult literature or they critique texts. Um, um, they even do drama, <laughs> uh, like a lot podcast and things like that. But we do in that context, we do have conversations about, you know, uh, what's the purpose and role of, of sound, music and effects um, in your in your uh, composition. Do we have any other questions um, from other participants? Uh, maybe their experiences uh, of working with audio? Um. I feel you have to start somewhere and you know maybe your podcast won't sound perfect the first time out, but you're going to learn so much from just having done it the first time. That's really, really good. Um, and you know what I would say is, um, impose some limitations on yourself right away, which is um, to get yourself clear and clean. If you need to have a script, go ahead and write one. And then finally, uh, limit yourself to a few minutes here and there. Just, you know, three-minute podcast, five-minute podcast, and see how you do. Uh, I noticed that that, that that steps that I was sharing, that really writing a, a script and, and talking about um, about it, and I call it like uh, workshopping it with peers and also with me. It really helps us to, to understand, you know, what's the message, what you want to communicate, and whether the way you have written the script and then the way you are recording, uh, recording it, whether it's really, in, in, you know, uh, reflecting your intent. And we can have really deep conversation about all kinds of things, about podcasts as a genre, conventions, and, and things like that. Uh, and then, you know, the whole conversation about why would you like to have music here, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know initially when we have a conversation, um, you know, sometimes you, you get just a response, oh, oh, it would be nice. I say, what nice means in this context? What do you want your listeners to, uh, you know, how you want to affect your listeners? What kind of message you're trying to um, you know, to communicate uh, to the listeners also 
with this additional tool, meaning making They're going to close the room, so thank you both. Oh, yes, yeah, so thank you so much. We are just leaving. Welcome back to the main room, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your first of two rounds of breakout presentations. Uh, we will share the schedule again in the chat, and we invite you to select your second breakout room. We built in the same five minutes uh, for people to switch, so we're shooting for a 120 start from presenters. And there have been some issues with uh, folks not being able to move themselves into rooms, so if that applies to you, we have Alex, who's doing our tech support on the NCT and here in the main room and you can unmute your microphone in a minute or write in the chat if you're having trouble moving and he will switch you manually. Um, thanks again to everyone for coming. I'm Lauren Zucker and your other co-host safety chair is Nicole D'Amico. Wow. Thank you. So I, I've shared my screen too so you can see the round two sessions. Um, again, as Lauren said, if you, you should be able to, most of you should be able to move yourself to your own breakout rooms. If you go to the bottom, the navigation toolbar, you, there will be a button that says breakout, or you'll click the more, the, the three dots, and you'll be able to see um, where you can add yourself to the breakout rooms. Do you want me to open up with the breakout rooms? Yeah, thank you, Alex. Okay, perfect. They're all open right now. Great. And we'll stay here in the in the main room to kind of help facilitate transitions too. Can you add Amy Hendricks to room seven? Hello? Can you hear me? wait until everyone oh I gotta unmute hello <laughs> I was muted can you hear me okay thank you Allison. all right great all right I'll give it a minute or so um, and then I'll share my screen so still joining so 30 more seconds and then we'll do this and hopefully have a conversation on game design and game composing all right so uh, my name is Thor Gibbons I am an associate professor in English and literacy education at SUNY Oneonta and I'm also uh, co-director of the Leather Stocking Writing Project. So a little background on this um, working model that I'm going to show is uh, our um, writing project received an LNRG grant to fund a, a young video game designer camp um, originally for kids going from third to eighth grade. So we had two camps, third and fourth grade, and then um, or fourth and fifth grade and then six, seven, and eight. And then this last summer we did, we moved to kind of a master camp for middle school, high school kids. And um, I introduced um, Construct 3 as the primary um, game design engine. Um, so that's a little back background on kind of how I'm developing this. And now I'm moving into doing this with PD, with teachers um, in this upcoming year. So let me just share my screen so. So 
So a little bit of uh, my kind of a working model or worked model is um, trying to create up kind of a, a, a thesis um, on uh, game design engines and game design um, writing is that it is an English language art. And these are kind of the new New York State uh, Education Department um, next generation standards. And I really like the preface of these ELA next gen standards around these lifelong practices of readers and lifelong practices of writers. And my case that I'm trying to develop and when I develop my PD is that game design can be easily embedded into these kind of lifelong practices. Um, game design is multimodal composition in sound, um, picture, and text and it also is writing across the curriculum meaning it's expository writing it's narrative writing it's coding writing um, so when you design a game you are writing in many different genres and um, so that kind of gives kids uh, a chance to kind of see how uh, writing for the same kind of purpose on video game is change uh, the different genres kind of change kind of the structure of what you're trying to do. Um, another um, context is uh, for lifelong readers and writers is it's challenging, um, which I have here. Um, so it, I think game design and game design composition um, gets kids to um, persevere and through challenging tasks because because it is challenging. It is kind of working um, with visual coding and um, expository and narrative writing, it can be challenging. So it, um, it gets uh, kids to kind of persevere through that kind of negotiating those different kind of levels. And then um, enriching language and vocabulary is um, one aspect of, because you, you learn a technical register in game design. Um, and so you're using new, new language, uh, using it academically. So it's accountable talk. And then uh, one thing with game design is uh, with modding and remixing uh, is you're allowed to mod and remix mentor text. So it actually um, functions this way as, as kind of how you would use mentor text in your writing workshop. And that's kind of how I structure um, the Video Game Design Institute is around writing workshop. So if you're familiar with writing workshop, it kind of works very similar to that. Um, so I am going to play this. This is a, a mentor um, a working model uh, approach. So um, G asserts that a working model is kind of a, a tool that can start a point, can demonstrate theoretical claims, develop contextual framing, illustrate inferences or hypotheses. So this is kind of the framework that I'm presenting my work today with the teens at the Leather Stocking Writing Project and the Video Game Design Institute. And the intention is, again, to provide a working model to carry this forward for in-service educators in a series of professional development seminars that I'm thinking for this summer that will carry on into a year-long institute and also embedding it into a pre-service educator um, within my teacher education program within the classes that I teach. So I would really like to hear ideas from the audience of how I could do that um, if, if um, I'm assuming many of you are teacher educators. So. So let's play this. It's about 11 minutes long. So we're here. Um, super mission number two is I want you. Oops. I just want you to um, do two things with this demon noir. So you're going to modify this game. So you'll open up the project and you can hit play. And right now, WSD keys don't work. Um, is, so movement keys are left, right. Um, so I want you to change the binding. Key is down, WASD. But I also, uh, mission number two, is I want you to um, also Give them a mage skill, so you are going to need to create a, a sprite, a bullet sprite, um, make it fire, a fire bullet sprite, and have the character on right click shoot fire. So that's your mission. WASD bindings and uh, right click mouse 
a bullet with fire, so he's like a mage. So now. with Construct 3, there's a mentor text where you can get the code and then add in your own um, remixing um, with okay, doing fire. that. The one thing I like about Construct 3 is you don't need to know coding. You don't need to know C-sharp or Python. Um, so it's kind of like a good bridge into like Unity or Unreal um, without needing the code. Um, but it's also teaching the, the logic of coding without needing to know the code. And these are the kids' um, games after four days of playing around. Uh, can't hear him. I had my headphones on when I was doing it, so I didn't realize that the audio was going to be muted when I was recording these. But he's kind of play testing and walking through and presenting his game. We tried to present like uh, how you would video game designers would present at an E3 conference um, their games to an audience. And so that's what we kind of did. With the COVID, stay at home in New York over the summer, we did this over Discord rather than face-to-face. In this, he was actually asking his colleagues in Discord kind of how to um, edit or revise uh, his game to meet what he wanted to do. And one of the kids in the camp was um, guiding him through this. thing about Construct 3 is uh, okay. it's available as a URL meaning you just need a, a browser okay, so to do title? to do the work and uh, there's a free version that gives you 20 events so you can actually make a, a, a short game just using the free version and you have a lot of assets that you can use like those uh, the RPG assets that we were I was using at the beginning This is um, one of the designers. She was using um, the RPG assets to do her kind of first level of her game. And another. Yes. I liked how he used text to kind of teach the rule set for this game. His game was really long, so I tried to edit out. Um, 
some of the, the participants were asking him questions, so he was kind of showing him his design pro process and how he was doing the visual layouts. Um, and the tile mapping. This is how he was creating the walls. He was trying to debug um, why sometimes the, the, the bullet wouldn't work or it would go through the walls. Um, and so we were, he was explaining the process. And I think what I ended up coaching him on is that he could use um, the block as aspects of this to create um, using tile map function, function that creates a hard uh, object. I'll give you some, yeah, this is uh, I'm gonna give you some feedback and you can play around with this. Um, one thing you can think about instead of creating a sprite for your walls is to make it a tile map um, and use tile map editor to do that. It might make things a little bit easier. That's what I was doing with my platformer. Um, so it's all my platforms and my decorations was a tile map. Um, and uh, you could, yeah, you could, yeah, uh, yes, because you can mirror rotate um, those. Um, and you might want to, like, find. So you could maybe play around with a tile map that's on the that platformer one and see if that might um, make it. Because what happens is tile map objects. The function of solid anyway and that might be the bugging problems that you're having with your walls um, you won't get that if it's a, if it's kind of based on the kind of the tile map and already programmed that everything that has this tile map function is going to be solid so that's something this was the uh, the brother of the okay. the bullet game uh, he was the younger brother so middle school. working with power-ups, which was really an interesting thing that he did with this. And then there's the kind of the narrative that he was building in with this game. He had a really great narrative you around that. So here I am play testing um, one of the kids' games that he had just got finished with kind of working on. Can I shoot these enemies or I have to just avoid them? Alright, I gotcha. So what uh, modded snow golem was talking about, see how I'm like, looks like I'm floating in the air on this? So you can go in and edit, like if you double click on the tile that you made right here, you can change the hitboxes and move them down so only the solid part would line kind of with this blue that my mouse is going over and it will look like I'm walking down. And so you're not, so you're not, so I don't have to hit the jump function to get over here, it'll actually, it'll just have the hitboxes changed, it'll actually walk up just a little bit. Oh, that. 
Uh, what are the what's the what's the end goal on this? One thing you can add is uh, checkpoints. So if I die, I can go back to a certain spot. Um, all right. So on, say, see how this this one lava is. What I can do is um, collision polygon. So it's this little triangle. I can sh you can edit by shifting down here. And now the hitboxes, the solids, just this part. And so this part, it'll like, it won't. The, the, the sprite's not going to feel like this whole square is an ob is a solid. Does that make sense? Okay. Hey, our friends here are going to draw a cupcake. Yeah, we're going to draw a Oops. scary cupcake. Well, when it's folded, Let's it's. Close. Close that. Not fast on the draw for that. Uh, all right. Yeah. So I'm opening it up now to questions, um, ideas. So you had mentioned that you had a, a question earlier. What, can you repeat that question? What's, what question do you mean? Uh, you said like um, something about uh, addressing teacher educators. Oh, or... how, yes, yeah. How, um, because I was working with kids and I'm trying to get this into like working with teacher teachers and teacher educators and kind of um, helping them out see this as a path or embedding it into maybe a class, a teacher education class or um, PD as well. So ideas would be appreciated. Something that I've looked into doing um, is focusing on like narrative based games. I'm not entirely um, familiar with the program you were using, but maybe focusing um, on how you can teach a story or understand uh, text through the game might be uh, an avenue. Right. That you might want to pursue yeah we were um in the camp we did have them uh, originally when we did this face-to-face -face 2019 uh, we would have them actually do kind of more writing workshop where they worked around just writing narrative without even getting into the design engine um and seeing kind of the story base of kind of the story of narratives and even kind of more games that are oriented towards more mechanics say pac-man there is a narrative that can be explored right so yeah, that's a really good point um, to think about, especially with English language arts teachers. Is that's where the hook we can pop, where I could probably hook ELA teachers is in more kind of that narrative aspect of games. So that's a great idea. Um, I I really like this project. I'm currently a pre-service teacher, so I'm student teaching next semester, and I feel like something that's like really interesting about this is that if you talk about kind of like the mechanics portion, I can see teachers being more comfortable with maybe given like, like something like Pac-Man or Bomberman and then having students add a narrative to that mm -hmm. more explicit. Cause it's definitely like, I feel like it's easier to hook teachers that way, especially if they're older, maybe not as familiar with video games. But like, I mean, I like video games a lot, which is why I came in here. So I, I can see this being a really cool way of also exploring like how does like color and like tone, like that, all of that stuff. So I really like this. You said that this is a URL uh, based thing. Yeah, it's it's called Construct 3 uh, and it's, so you don't, kids don't, teachers and kids do not need to download software for this. You just need a browser. That's why we chose it because we were, we had to go on Discord and teach online this, this summer. And it was basically the only one that, one, if kids had access to the internet in a browser, they could get on and do this. And that was, and also, the, um, it's a, it's kind of a bridge between kind of, we use GameStar Mechanic as our beginner level, which is um, kind of a point and click kind of design engine that's actually was designed for educators to teach um, design thinking for young kids, like grades 
say fourth through seventh grade. Um, so it was a bridge moving them with Construct 3. They didn't need to know like C Sharp or Python, although there's a couple of kids in there that were actually um, pretty proficient in C Sharp, which was really fun to, to listen to how they talked. Um, but could then bridge to another program that we're thinking like, well, what are we gonna do with these middle school kids that have already done Construct 3 and want something? And so we can move into Unity, Unreal, or the MIT open um, software called Godot, which you can, with well, Construct 3, you can produce a professional game just with that, but also those are more with 3D, um, uh, designing 3D games. So, And you do need to have some kind of coding background to kind of really do that well. So that's kind of where we're going with that. But Construct 3, URL, um, yeah. So you don't have to worry about downloading software or anything like that, um, especially if you're using like Chromebooks. Um, they just need to have a, a browser. Yeah, this is, this is really cool. I can definitely see this as a, as a way of like putting an assessment at the end of a book because I think one of the big things about games is that you can build empathy with your characters mm -hmm. because you are the one controlling. So it could probably be a sell for teachers if you're thinking about um, like a way to make literature assessments interesting, making making them make a video game level based off of a character in like a chapter of a book. It's interesting yeah. that you said that because I presented like in Boston, oh my goodness, a long six years ago with GameStar Mechanic with some sixth graders in a uh, school in Baltimore um, where they remixed a level of Percy Jackson, the Lightning Thief, um, which is exactly what you're talking about, and it was amazing. So, yes, yeah, do that oh, if you can. That's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah, this is really cool. Thank you so much for presenting. You're welcome. Thank you for attending. Um, and we do have a writing project channel. We're trying to do like teachers play games. So we're trying to maybe uh, shift out to Twitch um, where we play like table based games, but also video games and talk about how we might remix them for classes. So we're, we're... I've seen board games more popular in classrooms nowadays just because it's so much more tactile, at least, you know, yeah. in real life when we back in the old days. Um, yeah, I, I've had like teachers use that to like teach um, expository writing. I yes. Instruction. Yeah, technical writing and expository is so important, um, and you, and you don't think about when uh, we're teaching games. We we focus we do focus a lot on the narrative, but there are those expository elements that kids need to know how to write um, that are important. And they need to be able to articulate kind of um, technical writing on rules, how to write rules, right? And it's a little bit different than writing a narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I really like the um, the presenting that they have to do, like an E3 conference. That's definitely like when I talk to kids, and if they know what E3 is, then <laughs> I'm sure that they'll also get into that. When we went face to face the first year, they had so much fun, and I was doing PD with teachers doing this, and the teachers came in and watched them present, and. The kids just, they were standing in front of the flat screen and they would have kids play test them as they were walking. It, it's so much better face to face. It's harder on Discord. But um, yeah, I think that's the most important. It's an author's chair and celebration. So that's definitely what you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I definitely gave you guys a follow because I totally want to keep right. looking into this. All right. Thank you. And maybe we'll uh, do a Discord and play games, we'll do some games. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, do you. If I want to do that with you guys, do I just like shoot you guys a DM? Yeah, send me an email and I can. We have a writing project Discord, so um, we have our game design Discord. But we also have a writing project Discord site you can jump on. After. All right, cool. I will definitely do that then. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. Very cool stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. That return to the main room function is not forgiving, right? It's like you're <laughs> Thank you for the quick questions, Laura. <laughs> yeah, sorry we didn't have more time, Alan. It was good. So we want to thank everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and presenting with us today. Um, we are just 
We are just so rich in community and the, the wonderful innovative things we're doing. In the link to the chat, I've included another link to the presenter agenda with uh, links that they've shared with resources and handouts. And then another link, if you're not a member of Delight yet, we'd love for you to join us. So the second link was a link for our membership form. So it's just a quick form and let us know who you are, where you're coming from, and um, we'll be happy to put plug you into our uh, communications and um, keep you abreast of what we're doing in Delight. In the, in the last two or three years, we've had several projects with collaboratively written articles. So we have about four or five that are kind of in the works right now, but I can imagine on the horizon there'll be proposals for more um, co-written pieces. And just in kind of in the chatter during this session, there's talk about um, trying to get together again before next year's NCTE to do something like this since we have so many incredible um, members of our community who all have lots to share. And we'd all love to both present and attend as many sessions as possible. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And we hope to see you at our um, commission meeting on December 3rd. Thanks, everyone. Happy NCTE. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you. Bye. See everyone on third. Oh.